Well, good morning, everybody. This is Dr. Craig Wiener at Change Your Mind Transformational Dialogue Radio. And it is my great honor, it is my great pleasure to have as my guest on the show today, uh, Gary Craig. And Gary Craig, as I would say many of you know, but not all of you, so I'm going to give a little background and ask him for his background. Gary Craig is the founder of EFD, otherwise known as the Emotional Freedom Technique, which really has spread around the world as a technique that's used by millions of people for well-being, for health, for transforming their lives in so many ways. And so I would just like to get right into it and jump in because his time is valuable and I, and I appreciate him so being on the show. So I'd like to say welcome, Gary. Um, thank you for having me. Great. You're calling in from, um, we're speaking to you in Northern California. I hope you're having a beautiful day there this morning. We are. Not a cloud in the sky and it's just as sunny as it can be. Oh, that's wonderful. I love that. Um, so, Gary, we're going to have a lot to talk about and I'm really anxious for that. But I'm going to start off, you know, in EFT, a lot of times we find and we explore backgrounds and history and, and why people do the things they do. So, so I'm going to take you back a little bit because somewhere a couple years ago there was a young Gary that had a vision maybe for something great or saw the possibility for people's lives early on. And so I'm going to do a little retrospect for a second. And if you could go back to a time in your life now and look at, wow, I can see really the stars in my eyes that... I was going to create something or there was something that I wanted to connect it to early in my life. Could you go to some point back there that might give us some insight into why and who you are and what you've done? Well, yeah, sure. It would be age 13. And what happened? <laughs> and that's a ways back there, okay? <laughs> uh, since I was born in 19, 1940, you know, the, um, I, w I, was, I was heavily into sports. I mean, I loved baseball and, and things like that. It, just, it was the center of my world. And and as a young boy will do, I kept imagining, you know, the, the, the home run and the stolen base and all the little fantasies, you know, young, young boys have. Mm -hmm. And I had a vivid imagination, and, and I would find that the quality of my play was, was uh, directly related, you know, to my thoughts, my fantasies, etc. I mean, some of these little fantasies and balls I was hitting, this kind of thing, came true exactly as I had imagined them. And that was really interesting to me, but I thought everybody did that, <laughs> you know? So I didn't really run around telling my friends what I was doing. I thought they were doing it too, you know? I just didn't pay attention to it. But later on, later on as I got older, I was fascinated as a result of that, and I found out not everybody did that. And so I was very into the, uh, what I call personal psychology, you know, you are what you think you are type stuff. And so even though I was, it was never my avocation, I'm really a Stanford trained engineer, that's where, that's where my passion took me, you know. So it was that kind of idea that I, where I eventually uh, uh, met a uh, Roger Callahan in the early oh, 90s. So I, want to, I want to go back just for a second before we get to Roger because that's a really important piece. Did you have any favorite authors or were there any books that really inspired you as you were moving through high school and before you decided to become an engineer? Anybody in particular? Oh, yeah, but the, the old classics. I, re I remember, um, gosh, what was the name of that book? Um, Richest Man in Babylon and back in that kind of series, Carnegie and... Well, yeah, Dale Carnegie was one of them, you know, but there was a... You know, I'm just drawing a blank on... on but but I, I, I had read all of those You Are What You Think books. And, right. I mean, I had them just about memorized, you know. Um, and so, yeah, that was my that was my found that was my foundation. So, how does somebody come from a sports enthusiast and a uh, be what you think you are to becoming an engineer? Well, it's kind of a practical thing. Uh, you know, I, I I managed to go to Stanford because I was good enough in football to get a football scholarship. You know, so I mean, sports got me there. But when I got there, you know, I only weighed 165 pounds. That's you know, I'm not going to make my living playing football. <laughs> you know? Right. Uh, so you know, the practical thing was I was good at math and and that kind of thing. And so um, I just went into the engineering area because at, at the time that was supposed to be a good thing to go into. And you know, I went into it, but I never was an engineer. I I ended up being someone who was in the investment business and the insurance business and that kind of thing. 
Got it. Okay. So you have a thing for numbers. So then we transition from being in investments and being in that kind of world, and then all of a sudden, please help me. How do you go from there to Roger Callahan? And you know, he's the de the developer of Thought Field Therapy, a psychologist. How, tell me about that jump. Well, I was. Um uh, in the background, I was always fascinated by you are what you think, you know. Uh, and so, you know, I've, I've continued to read the books, and and you know, I'd even attend some of the w workshops. And so, I remember I, I was interested in what Tony Robbins was doing at one point, learning learning all about NLP and and uh, that that kind of thing. And and eventually, um, I had a lady friend. Her name is Adrian. Uh, those who saw our very, very first EFT course saw her on there, and she had a she had a friend that knew Roger Callahan, and so I was talking to her friend, and he said, "Well, I know a fellow who can who can um, take care of phobias in five minutes." You know, I said, "Really?" You know, so I want to meet him. So I called up Roger, and Roger and I eventually got together. I took his courses and so on, and and that's how I learned that. I was never anybody who would considered to be a therapist, if you will. Uh, to, to me, all you need to do at, at that stage of my, of my understanding was just you know, change your thoughts and you'll change your world. You know? but it's, I know it's not really quite that simple now. Okay. But that's how I got started. I was fascinated by it. You know? So that's where we were. Were you, I bet at that point, you probably were one of the only non-therapist type of people involved in the study. I mean, there weren't a whole lot, I imagine, like yourself. So. Um, as, yeah, as I recall it, I was the only one. In fact, I, I remember making a comment to Roger, saying, "You know, Roger, should I really be doing this? Because I'm not a licensed therapist and all that kind of stuff." And I, I, I'll never forget his reaction. Uh, he said, "He said that's good." And I said, "Well, why is that?" He says, "It's because you has you have less to unlearn," <laughs> which became actually prophetic, you know, because yes. EFT is so different from conventional therapy that that a lot of people that are heavily trained in the more conventional ways have a hard time letting go of everything that they've learned so far to let this new concept in because it it uh, is quite different in fact even violates some of the some of the sacrosanct rules of conventional therapy so i mean so I, anyway i found that enter entertaining and and insightful when Roger said that well i think that's actually a really important and large um perspective because as EFT, and, and we'll talk about it uh, deeper what it is in a minute, but as it sits in the world of um, psychology, we'll just kind of use that as a broad term of, of basically the science and practice of what we think and how that affects everything in our lives, um, it has become so mandated that to work with that, one has to come from a particular perspective. And here EFT is saying, well, we can still work with thoughts and beliefs and feelings, but one doesn't necessarily have to come from a psychotherapeutic model. And that's caused a lot of ripples. It's opened the door wide open to a lot of people being able to work with those things. It's, it has its challenges, but it also has its great gifts, doesn't it? Well, yeah, and it, it's a kind of a a double-edged sword. I mean, when Roger first brought this out, and, and God, God bless him, it, it, it was, he was the only one out there doing this kind of thing. I mean, we're tapping on the body with our fingertips to, to stimulate some meridians in the body, and that's supposed to be therapy. I mean, it looks really strange, you know. And so at that point, while he was having a very hard time with the conventional therapy folks, because they were, they were ridiculing him and and he wasn't about to take it, you know. <laughs> had to have a very thick skin, you know. But he did, and he kept that. He kept after it. So I, that's really great. It opened the door for a lot of people to do a lot of things, you know. The, I mean, the, the housewife someplace uh, who wants to take care of her headaches now has a tool to do that without using any drugs, etc. Now I'm not by that saying we're supposed to you know, ignore our doctors. Of course, we need to pay attention to the medical profession, etc. But as a is a is a standard tool that people can use for everyday things, you know, it became quite popular. You know, very popular, spread all around the world this way. It did. One of the I, I do have to mention that one of the difficult things about that is that some people get so enthusiastic about it 
that they start thinking they can do with it things they really shouldn't do. They start going where they shouldn't belong. Sometimes people get involved that have no therapeutic backgrounds whatsoever and right. try it's to handle somebody with some, some severe psychosis. And they're going to run into right. trouble because they're just going where they don't belong and, and they need more background and training. So that's and the that's unfortunate thing. That does happen from time to time, but fortunately it's uh, rather infrequent. Sure. And, you know, that, that sometimes is a challenge with enthusiasm that comes along with coming in contact with something powerful. That one sure. has to then learn to establish one's boundaries of, of safety and where one should stay and where when one's over one's head with oneself or working with another person. And that, that's yeah, there's, this is my any estimate. healing modality. Yeah, this, this is my estimate, Craig, but I, but, I, but I think there's about 3 or 4% of our population that shouldn't, that shouldn't uh, try any form of therapeutic modality, healing, healing process without the presence of a skilled professional. I mean, their emotional and physical frailty is such that they just shouldn't do that, you know, and, and right. um, so they really need to have somebody by their side as these things are. Assembled. That's not just for EFT, that's for, for all kinds of things. Right, and who knows what that percentage is, but it certainly is a percentage, and we need to be, whether we're working on ourselves or working with somebody else professionally or a family member, we need to be very diligent of those things. So, yeah, it's very important. And as a chiropractor, I certainly know, you know, we call them red flags. In other words, when we run in to something that says, oh, you know, we need to stop here and take a look, either have an MRI, we need to get a consultation from, from an orthopedic surgeon, et cetera. You know, we all have those places that we need to work in collaboration. Of course. So in, in stepping back a little bit, um, so let's go back to how EFT formed out of Roger's work. So Roger, as I understand it, was using, as you said, um, a blend of tapping and stimulating these acupuncture points on meridians and working in a psychological arena. How did it happen for you that EFT developed to take it wider and outside of just that, the direction that you took it? Well, I don't know that it's sort of wider and outside of that. That's not quite the way I would I would say it. Um, it was it was rather it was rather I was watching what R Roger was doing, and and uh, the way he was doing it to me. Now, this is not to an engineer, okay? Roger's not an engineer, and I'm not a psychologist, so you can imagine some of the conversations we have, you know. Uh, but but Roger would start doing some things that that he thought were scientific, and I as an engineer, uh, I, I didn't think so. And by the, by the same token, you know, some of the thoughts I had about psychology would make Roger roll, roll his eyes, you know. Absolutely. But so I started looking at what he was doing, and I thought, I thought it was just unnecessarily complex. Now, but please let me interject here. That's my view. Uh, there are a lot of people that work with, with Roger still. Uh, they, uh, they're uh, almost like disciples of his, and and they like what I think is a rather overly complex process and works, works and works fine and I'm not trying to dissuade anybody from it. But to me, to be able to, to put that in the hands of the everyday citizen, uh, it's just an onerous task, you know, it just it couldn't happen. So I started looking at it and, and I took the process apart like engineers would do, and I'd put it back together and take it apart, and put it back together and take it apart, you know, and, and evaluating all of its parts. And eventually I would just throw out to some things that I didn't think were necessary, and I developed the whole thing into one simple mechanical process. We call it the basic recipe that anyone can use. And I found in practice it was just as powerful, and I think in some ways it's even more powerful, but that, again, that's my opinion. Uh, you know, than, than what Roger was, was doing at the time. That's a long answer to your question, but I, I hope I did the job sure. there. Well, has, and, you know, it's interesting. I, I've reached out uh, to the EFT community and practitioners, and, you know, uh, my, my secret is I said, look, if you had an hour with Gary, what would you ask him? And so I, I, I received a lot of questions, but one that was particularly repetitive was over the time now from the development early on, and now looking back in retrospect, uh, and how how EFT developed, not that you could ever go back and change anything with the technique, but what have you learned about um, the way that you developed the tapping and technique, the point that it evolved that maybe you wish you knew sooner? Or if you could go back and have only taught a particular way, would you make any changes in that? Well, I've refined it over time as we've learned that 
that certain things are not as useful as other things. I mean, there's a part of the process called the nine gamut, for example. It, 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 sure, please say what that is for those that don't know. Well, it, so it, it's kind of a brain a balancing bit. process that Rod, Roger created, uh, and it, it, it amounts to tapping continuously on a certain point on the back of your hand. It's called a triple warmer uh, in Chinese terms, but but you, you continually tap on that, and you roll your eyes and and you hum and you count and you're trying to involve the right and left side of your brains and brain and all of that. And that has some really good use from time to time. But I found that to put that in as a part of the regular process, and by the way, I had it there at the beginning, okay? Mm -hmm. right. But eventually I took it out and put it on the shelf and said, let's just use that process if we think we need to, if we're striking out someplace uh, and not making the progress we want, let's bring that back in. And that, that actually made the whole process a lot more streamlined because you didn't need it very often. Right. And the one thing that made the whole process look so silly to the uninitiated newcomer was this rolling your eyes around your head and humming happy birthday and stuff like that. Right. You know, it was really <laughs> too far out for most people. So by eliminating that, or at least putting it on the shelf for, for sparing uses, um, it made the whole process a lot more easy for people to digest, and it was it was just about as powerful. Okay, so really, I always sensed of you as an engineer of looking how can I be most efficient with the system? How can I use the least amount of energy and still get the greatest result? Yeah, that's that's, that's, that's seemed like that streamlining process was part of that for you. Yeah, and so I'm gradually refined here and there, but. You know, when you look by, look back at it, the, we've been using the same concept, if you will, of tapping on the radians and tapping on these various points uh, since I started this in the mid 1990s, um, and I really haven't changed that that essential piece. There have been little refinements and that kind of stuff, and but the the, the been, essence has not changed at all. There's been one recently. Can you speak a little bit just? Um, there's curiosity out in their field uh, speaking about what's referred to in EFT as the setup point and psychological reversals. And um, Could you speak a little bit about that because there's a lot of interest in your current view on that. Yeah, psychological reversal was a, was a concept that uh, um, Roger had learned from, from, another, from an MD by the name of John Diamond. Right. And basically what it seemed to be doing was to pinpoint the idea that that some people are, I guess the term is reversed against, you know, being able to, to heal. They're, the way Roger would put it is, is when they start to think about something like losing weight or getting over a certain issue. Uh, in his view, the energy meridians in the body, the, would, the polarity would change, meaning, meaning in simplest terms, the energy would run in the opposite direction. And that supposedly was supposed to actually stop EFT from working, and then Roger developed a psychological reversal tapping routine for that, et cetera, which I brought into, and, and uh, you know, it's useful and all of that. But as time went on, I kept looking at that, and it just didn't quite match up to me. Now, again, I really got to emphasize this is my opinion. Absolutely. You know, Roger would disagree with it, okay? But I kept saying, well, we're, you know, we're not talking way. about TFT right now. We're talking about EFT. Yeah, Ro Roger called this stuff thought field therapy or TFT. Right. But I would look at that and and I say, no, that's you know, there's another concept within psycho speak, if you will. It's called secondary gain, and basically that means um, you know people have a built-in reason not to get well. An example of that would be someone in a wheelchair who's receiving you know, disability income payments. And, and, and they are in the wheelchair and they are getting a lot of love and attention from their family they didn't used to get. They have reason to stay in their wheelchair. Okay. Yeah, and when, when uh, Alina and I teach that, that's also something we tread very sensitively on because many of those secondary gain issues are subconscious and they're not even aware of them. Yeah, and that, that, that's very true. And so I began to think, you know, I don't, I'm not sure there really is a psychological reversal. Uh, in fact, I really haven't haven't officially even used that for years, and, my, and none of my results changed at all. I mean, I still get the same kind of result. So I'm just I, I've sort of told the world I, I'm not really buying into that 
concept now. I don't think we need it, so it's just really a form of secondary gain, so let's just eliminate that. But that, that doesn't change materially the way we use the tapping process, interestingly enough. I just took that concept okay. out. So we're just taking away the idea of EFT, the psychological reversal that is as it exists as a reverse polarity. We still understand that there are maybe sub, um, subconscious secondary gains, and we're still using the setup point as we always have. We're just getting, we're letting go of that PR or psychological reversal as a sense of a polarity shift. Yes. Yeah, and, and here's right. where we get into some of the sophistication of of EFT. Um, I have found that that if if you're stuck on something with somebody's issue, you're not going any place. That that uh, it's not, in my experience, psychological reversal that is stopping the process. Rather. We haven't really gotten down into the core issue yet. Uh, we're still on the surface someplace. You've got to start asking questions about oh, specific events in one's life, you know, that that might have given one reason to, you know, be where they are on their on their issues and this kind of thing. And, and you get down to those specific events, which are the building blocks of everything I found in time, uh, and take care of those. Which EFT does beautifully once you get down to the smaller pieces. Uh, you take care of those, and then you know the larger issue that psychological reversal was supposed to have uh, thwarted. It, it just disappears, like, like there was no ever such thing as psychological reversal. So, you know, yeah, no, I'm going to just go right with you because. Um, so, for those that don't know, my wife uh, Lena Frank is a, is a EFT trainer, and one of the things she's always credited you with, Gary, is saying just as Gary said. In order to be terrific, you have to be specific. And she always speak, speaks to this insatiable curiosity of getting down to the right questions. And, and I think I hear from you saying that it takes that kind of level of questioning and exploring till you find, and when you do find, the right something that happened in the past, the right um, circumstance or story that happened then, EFT will knock it out and create change. Am yeah, I let me give you a, a classic example, if I can. Uh, uh, Craig, um, you know our, our veterans. Our veterans are coming back with this post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD. Absolutely. And what what some people in the energy psychology or EFT community do that, that may not have learned it at the higher levels, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll try to help the vet, and they will start off the process by aiming it at their PTSD. You know. Um, and that's that's going at it a bit too globally because PTSD. I mean that that whole ailment is there because they've had a lot of specific events in their combat experiences. And so if if you try to go for the PTSD is the general label rather than the specific events that caused it, it's like trying to chop down an entire forest. Of diseased trees with one swing of the axe, it just doesn't work very well. Now you can give them some relief by doing that, but better. But what you really need to do with those vets is to take that that specific time when they were in that foxhole and that hand grenade went off and all the screams and all the other gory things that happened at that point that that contributed to their overall PTSD and their nightmares and everything. You go, you go take care of those and take care of those specific things and do it well and thoroughly and do a handful of those. The whole process generalizes and the PTSD magically collapses. It's really something to see. And it's, it's just delight, delightful to help these guys out with, with the need, kind of the need result. The so you know. great. And when we talk about the future, that's certainly a large demographic that we're seeing that potentially can be so helped as studies are continuing to show PTSD being helped by EFT. So and again, talking about those uh, returning veterans that may have also had earlier traumas, that's where those specifics that you were talking about come into such importance. And, and it's been such a gift to be able to work with veterans like that. And I know that you've been a strong advocate of that. Well, you know, for those for those listening that are more into EFT and et cetera, I would I would make the comment that that if if in my experience with these with these veterans and I have a lot of it now, um, if you put if you take two veterans, both of whom were who 
were involved in the very same traumatic incident. One of them had a very well-rounded, very happy childhood, so to speak, and the other, it was abusive, full of trauma, and so on. It's the latter one, the one that, that has the traumatic foundation that goes into the war that is much more likely to get the PTSD than the one who's the one who is has the the less traumatic uh, yeah, experiences in, in childhood. It's like it's like the war experience exaggerates or builds upon uh, the traumatic foundation that was already there when they came into the war, and that's it's really something to understand. So sometimes to get these vets, you know even more thoroughly beyond their PTSD experience, you need to go back in, even into their childhood and some of those specific events you know, to clean that thing up more completely. Do you have a particular story that um, sinks in your heart for somebody that you worked with and can just picture that changed their life or has been in touch with you afterwards, how their life changed? Is there any story? Are you speaking of a vet or? Yes, I am. Well, um, yes, since we're on that subject, yes. Well, I have, you know, I have tons of them from all kinds of areas, but one of them was actually on film. The fellow, the fellow's name was Robert, and he was in the Vietnam War. And the part that didn't show on the film was when I was talking to him, he would, he would be recounting this experience where he was parked in a jeep outside of a village in, in Vietnam, and some young five-year-old boy starts walking towards him with a hand grenade in his hand. And and he, he he had to fire. He actually, had, he had to shoot the boy. And he had he had major trauma about that. He he couldn't even talk about that. Was just not crying and going into all kinds of things. And I remember he would say, "You don't shoot little kids." And we started doing EFT on that. And and the whole process shifted for him. And he had a, literally, literally had a belief change behind the scenes, which happens a lot with EFT, to the point where he eventually said, you know, the way that was, it was either him or me, because that kid was going to throw a loaded grenade into his Jeep, okay? And so, I mean, the, the guy was just so thankful about that. I mean, you, you deal with these vets, and I've got to tell you, it's, for the most part, they're very secretive, they're very within themselves. They don't think anybody can help them. And when you finally do, let me tell you, you become you become their dear friend forever. And you know, I've got a lot of vet veteran friends like that. When you give them that that kind of relief, you know. So we don't have enough time for me to give you all these no, stories. Okay, so I've got right. a lot of them. Now, now EFT, beside being used to help veterans, is also working around the world in a lot of different contexts, some of which we might hear about, some of which we don't. So can you maybe point to some of the areas around the world where you're excited to either see where EFT has gone or maybe going to, um, because you get to see and hear a lot of things that not all of us do. I'm curious what, what excites you in the arena of populations and places around the world where you're seeing EFT being used to affect change? Well, actually, those familiar with EFT know that you can, it, it addresses just about every emotional, physical, or performance issue you can name. I'm talking about serious diseases and everything, you know. And I've got a number of people that are friends of mine that were terminally ill. I mean, one, of, one that comes to mind, a lady with scleroderma, you know, and, and, she, and she was in massive pain, and she was given terminal, you know, terminal illness, you know, diagnosis by her physician, she's still with us and has no pain whatsoever and attributes it all to, to EFT. But, so, I mean, it's very hard to pick out just one little area. I mean, people with migraine headaches, my goodness, they go to bed for a week sometimes. And we've oftentimes had times where that migraine headache just disappears on the spot and goes away forever, you know. That's not everybody, but that's a good percentage of them. But well, with, with, with health care, I, I mean, to be really honest, Gary, when I first found out about EFT, I was skeptical because it was, you know, there were things that were written of, you know, try it on everything, try it on, and as a health care provider, I'm, I was skeptical. What one thing could help so, such a wide variety of conditions? Yeah. And it wasn't an unhealthy skepticism. It was just, well, you better prove that to me. And when I finally saw that really how I was able to accept that, 
was does stress affect everything? And that I could accept. That stress you could go. aggravate every condition. So so I'd like to ask you in your perception and as it's taught and spoken about what EFT does as far as energy, as far as stress, and how do you perceive what EFT is doing with regard to the body? Well, the way I put that, uh, Craig, is, 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 is I make sure people realize that we're not we're not competing with or replacing anything medical. I don't really, I don't know anything about medicine, you know. But rather, it's a different approach. Now, the medical approach, as I understand it, basically views the body, you know, as a bag full of bones, chemicals, and body parts. Okay, and 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 so they they address it that way. They address more like symptoms, etc. And, and that's not a hundred percent completely true, but it's generally the way I understand it. EFT, on the other hand, comes at it from a totally different approach. We're making the assumption that whatever issue we're dealing with, it has an emotional cause. Uh, if, it's a, if it's a physical ailment, we're making the assumption that, that either the energies in the body are, are disrupting, which is usually has an emotional cause, or it's just straight an emotional emotional cause, so the angers, the guilt, the griefs, the traumas, the fears, etc., that we would carry around within our body show up physically in these various ailments. So, all we're really doing with EFT is addressing the potential physical, excuse me, emotional contributor to these problems. And just making that assumption and going that route, we have found, we have found enormous strides are going on. I, I, I really wish the medical profession would pay attention to this because, because they know themselves that, and they call it stress like you did, that stress is a contributor to all of these things. I, I think it's one of the major causes, if not the major cause in some cases. But they, they know that, but they don't know what to do about it. They don't have, most of them, don't have specific training in what to do about it, so they would refer somebody to a psychologist or they would say, you know, you know, quit your job or something like that, you know. But now we have a tool they can deal with. They can either refer to somebody who is really a first class EFT or, or learn the process themselves. And so... Right. And no, I think that, that's very important. I was also going to add, I think the closest that's being come to this, that's being accepted in the healthcare field and medical field, is the surge of research and acceptance of, for example, mindfulness or mindfulness-based meditation. So some of the um, practices in that arena are being accepted as, wow, look at all this research that's showing how one is working with one's mind as a way to, that people can do themselves really is affecting their health. So I think things like EFT and, well, it's very distinct meditative practices are starting to really emerge and I think be accepted more and more, at least in my personal experience with the healthcare field, one, person, one practitioner at a time, of course. Yeah. To me, we're at the beginning of a wave. In fact, there's, there's one little estimate that I make and I have no way of proving this. This is just what I see from my own experience from years and years and years with this process, and that's this. If the medical profession really understood EFT and applied it in skillful ways, that's an important term, skillful ways, to their, to their patients before administering drugs, surgeries, radiations, and all the invasive techniques, that are our national health bill would, would be reduced by at least 50%, if not 80%. I think that I see that as definitely a possibility and certainly a vision to move towards that I'd love to see the result of. Yeah. Well, I've seen so much of it that, that you know, again, I can't prove that. That's just my, my seat of the pants, hip pocket, you know, estimate. Mm hmm Right, and we don't know, but certainly, you know, I just recently had an article published exploring some of the, what are called the ACE studies, right, the adverse childhood experiences where yes. they look at the populations of where there's been physical, emotional, and different types of abuse and violence, et cetera, childhood, and the result of how that creates adults with health problems and unhealthy habits. 
Yeah. And that kind of study is being accepted as what happens to us when we're young affects a body or bodies decades later. That kind of research points to the care that needs to be taken to resolve those kinds of traumas and explore that. And I think that EFT fits perfectly into that. Yeah. So, so um, back to we were talking about the veterans, and I'd like to um, again things around the world. So you know we've seen EFT used in Rwanda. We're seeing it used um, in different places where violence has been happening, but. Um, that kind of addresses what veterans have witnessed, but what about how do we get to performance, for example, and athletic performance and excellence? So that's a, a whole other level and different arena. Can you speak a little bit about that and your experience? Oh, sure. I, I have a very strong background, you know, in athletics myself, and you, you, you talk to any accomplished athlete and ask them, the, you know, what's the difference between a, you know, a good day and a not so good day on the athletic fields, and they'll tell you, they'll, they have different terms for it, but it's basically it's, it's in your head, they would say. You know, it's the mental set of the game. Uh, in fact, there was a very popular book written years ago, decades ago, actually, called The Inner Game of Tennis. You know, I remember it well. Yeah, where, where we're really talking about your mental set that makes the difference between the good day and the superb day, that kind of thing. And so, that, but that's also the same thing as saying it, it's, it's an emotional thing, you know. Let, let's take a very simple example with golf. That's a very popular sport. So, if you've ever played golf, you know, you'll, maybe you're in the middle of a fairway and, you, and you're going to pull out one of your woods or one of your irons and you're going to try to approach the green. And so, you, you're there and you do your backswing and as you do that, you know, <laughs> Something happens mentally, and you know you're going to mess this shot up. Okay, I mean that happens with some frequency. You know, you're even saying to yourself, "I'm going to mess this shot up." You know, and so you do it. All, all it takes is just a little bit of of adjustment in your swing with, that, this, that this mental set may influence, and you hit that ball a sixteenth of an inch or an eighth of an inch off of where you would like to hit it. And the thing, you know, tails off into the woods someplace, okay? And every golfer knows that. They, they know the difference. It's always, always in their head, so to speak. And I've had a lot of golfers who will learn EFT, and, and when they get to these points on the golf course, and they know that they can just feel this emotional doubt, if you will, come in, they start using EFT for it, and more often than not, you know, that, that errant shot just doesn't happen. They, they get the shot off what they want to, you know. So that's a so small have, have example. You it, right? Have you used it before putting? Do people see you tapping on the golf course when you got a difficult shot? How do you use it that way? I, I don't play golf that much, but I, I'm on film <laughs> with my son, who was not a, not a great golfer by any means. He was on a nine-hole course, and he typically shot in the high 50s or low 60s on a nine-hole course, okay? So I, you know, I got the camera out, and we, and we started tapping before every shot is what we did. We tapped before every single shot that he did, and he had never, ever, ever broken 50. And I hadn't even come close to it. And in this particular day, he hit 43. And that gives you an example. That's great. Actually, let's, let's, let's go there for a minute personally. I, all of us that have used EFT have challenges, and maybe either a certain type of person or situation that's hard to work with. What have been some of your challenges? Um, what do you find either more difficult to work with? Is it a particular issue, a personality type, a, a circumstance? I'm just curious where some of your challenges might have been. Well, the answer is going to be a little bit different maybe than you expect, uh, Craig, because since I, since I ran into it and developed this idea of, of breaking down complex issues into specific events, Mm -hmm. I, I found that you can take, I don't care how complex the issue is, wh whether it's you know, PTSD or somebody with cancer or somebody with multiple cirrhosis or, or, or so on, as long as you break it down into the specific events, you can handle just about anything. Now, that being said, that doesn't mean we just do this one little process and across the board we get 100% results. No. Um, but the real issue isn't isn't uh, so much the EFT process. Mm -hmm. It's the person involved. It's, it's the skill right. in trying to discern from the individual, the client, the patient, you know, what the real core issues are, where these specific events are. And that, and that takes a skill. That's an art. Right. 
to doing that. Now, now one area you'd have a lot of difficulty with would be someone with psychosis, someone with um, paranoia or schizophrenia, something like that. Now we do have we do have people that are reporting results on that, it, not cures, but improvements. Another one would be Alzheimer's, where the person involved can't even help you try to get back to some past events. But even at that, we've had some improvements in Alzheimer's. So it's more it's more about trying to customize it to the individual where the where the yeah. issues come up more so than the issue itself. And the skillfulness and rapport and trust and all of those issues that come into play when you're trying to support somebody and invite them in a way to be able to to remember yeah. those past events and remember details and being able to to enable that process, that art of happening is really the key. So difficulty would be in those people that are resistant to doing that or having challenges doing that. Yes. Yes. And and, and it's also it's also um, uh, we, we, we have to bring up the skills of the therapists themselves in there because if they're, they're a, brand, brand, a beginner at this, they're not going to be as good at, at smoking out these real issues as someone who's been around the block a number of times. Absolutely. And I'd say another important piece with that that um, I think is so important and you've spoken to in the past is uh, I'll simplify it by saying look, trying to knock out the, the negative first, right, rather than going to the positive, but just that ability to, to eliminate the resistance or those things that don't allow the energy and the healing to flow, the negative emotions, so to speak. Do you want to just address why that's so important first? Well, first of all, I want to thank you for bringing the question up, because that's one of the, one of the things that I've had a difficulty over time selling, if you will, uh, because conventional psychotherapy and the conventional books and all of this kind of stuff keeps talking about the positive. Oh, we want to be positive, we want to be positive, we want to be positive, you know. And and there's a lot, a lot of books about the positive, you know, doing positive affirmations and so on. And so and so people generally are conditioned for the fact that, oh gee, we want to be as positive as we can. And that's that's the opposite of what we're trying to do. What we're trying to do with EFT is Let's find the negative. I mean, let's really bring it up and put it on the table and take a look at it, because it's the negative that is causing the disruptions in the body's energy meridians that EFT addresses. So we need to tune in, if you will, to the negative aspect of it. Use EFT, collapse the negative. We're getting rid of the competition, if you will, to positive thinking. And once you get rid of the competition, then the natural joy, the natural positivity that we all possess uh, starts to bubble up to the top. And so when you start injecting positive phrases into the process, that doesn't mean our EFT process won't work, but you are diluting it when you do that unknowingly. And I really want to emphasize, we, you know, we. We're aiming for the villain here, and the villain is the, ne the negative emotion. We're not trying to cover it over with some positive statements. Right, and as a result of, you know, and as a chiropractor, it's a perfect analogy. When we remove the subluxation, nerve flow can happen. So when we remove that which gets in the way of healing and health, it's a natural state and a natural flow to move towards. And yeah. then as we move out of the symptoms into a more neutral or homeostatic or balanced state, then we can start to move toward mastery, excellence, extraordinariness. So as we move into that scale for a moment, um, there's that wholeness of being, that moving toward connection with all that is and moving into it. Connection toward spirit perhaps might be one way to put that. And I was wondering if you could address, I know that's been an important part in your life, how you see EFT facilitating that process to becoming not just a person lacking with, you know, getting rid of traumas and getting rid of negative emotions, but moving towards something even greater. Could you speak to that a little bit? Yes. Yeah. And again, thank you for that for that question because that that points up to me the the real value of EFT. Uh, most people look at EFT as boy, this is a great tool to take care of this ailment, that ailment, or something else in there. But to me. To me, the larger picture is we are removing the barriers to love's presence. 
And what I mean by that is when you get into the spiritual areas of things, um, and I realize when I start talking about this, I'm, I'm into religious and spiritual areas where people have different mm-hmm. different uh, views. So I try to be as general as I as I well, can. You're giving, but your, you're giving your view. You yeah, if you if you if you view God or Source, if you will, as pure love, which by the way is my experience, because I've had one of these not a near death experience, but it's like that. You know, where I flipped over one time back in 1988. And I was momentarily, for, for a little while, in the presence of the Creator. And, and there's nothing there, nothing there but love. There's no time, there's no space, there's no arguments, there's no money, there's no bodies, there's no ailments. There's nothing there but a pure love that is, that is of a degree that is indescribable here using, using words. So, you know, ultimately... Our world will be far, far, far more advanced and if, if the individuals can approach that state that I was in and that other people have reported over being in over time. And to me, if we can get rid of the barriers to that, which EFT can do so nicely, but you've got to keep doing it, then we get more and more people into this state, and that starts to spread and and so on. Um, that's when we will start really solving our world's problems of poverty and war and disease and so on. Because in that particular state, I guarantee you, there is no such thing as disease. It, it, it is an impossible state. And if you get to that state, you, you cannot have a physical ailment. It's just... It's just not, it's inconceivable. And so, to give you an example, you could say to somebody, oh, gee, you were abused by your parents. Why don't you just forgive them? And that's a really nice thing to say. And yes, let's just forgive them. But that's so easy to say and so hard to do when you're carrying around all this anger, etc., in this particular example. But if we can use EFT to collapse that so they see the abusive parent in this example as someone who needs help themselves and can generate a forms of forgiveness, understandings, if you will. Not necessarily to condone the behavior, but to understand things better, to forgive things better. That is how EFT should be used. That is its bigger arena that it, that it belongs in to help get us towards this more spiritual perspective. That's a long answer, but I, I hope it well, came I, across Well, I think that it was way. eloquent and beautiful and, you know, a perfect place to move toward a closing on, but it really speaks to moving toward transcendence, moving toward not just healing from that which hurts us, but being able to move on. I think it's really important because EFT is often associated with always focusing on the negative, which for good reason, as we just put in, you put in context. But ultimately where it's moving us towards is that place of transcendence and beauty and connection and where healing exists. I think he said it very well. Yeah, that, that is its big movement, and that's what I'm trying to do with my new, my new website. Uh, which, which, by the way, is... To the website URL for people. I'll let you. It's www.emofree. That's e m o f r e e dot com. It's short for emotional freedom. Emofree dot com. And you've redone the tutorials. You've added. You've uh, you've got the newsletter available on there. You've got tutorials there. Again, with a, a wonderfully generous policy, and so that that's wonderful. Yeah. What I'm trying to do with that is is um, turn the corner, so to speak. I mean, when I first put EFT out, it was come one, come all, look at this amazing thing and do what you want to do with it, no royalties involved, blend it with something else, innovate with it, etc. And people took me up on that's why it spread so much. But when it did that, we have a zillion people out there all using EFT and, and uh, 
filtering it through their own belief system. They're customizing it to their own. Yeah, that, that, that's a better word. And changing and altering based on who they are and their backgrounds. Yeah. But and, and, just, the, and the difficulty with that is it's very around. difficult for a newcomer to find any two people who do it the same. Right. So there's no standard. So my, my new tutorial has the standard there. For, I call it the gold standard. So it's the gold standard for anybody who wants to learn it from the source. That's great, and it's such an important resource, and I hope people readily use it because it is very valuable. Gary, this has really been quite an honor and a wonderful time. The time passes so quickly. It's been a pleasure being able to go back in time and forward in time and a little sideways. <laughs> well, my privilege, Greg, and thank you. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day, and I really hope that this is a service for people to get to, you know, get to listen to your voice and your stories and hear what you're up to. And um, I'm deeply grateful, and I thank you for your time. Okay, Gary, you have a beautiful day, and we'll see each other out on the ethers. Thank you, okay, uh, for everybody, and thank all the listeners of Change Your Mind Transformational Dialogue Radio. And you will see us again soon. Thank you so much for joining us. All right, thanks, Greg. You're very welcome, Gary.